This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we're continuing our run of reviews on Amicus Productions. This is a listener choice selection for November 2023. We've already covered two titles, there are two left and you're getting both those reviews this week. We are covering Torture Garden on this episode. Technically I believe this is the second in their anthologies, so the first being Doctor Terror's House of Horror. Um, they went into doing Torture Garden as the spiritual successor to that first one. They already had established the formula. This was building upon it to varying degrees of success, in my opinion. We'll get into more of that after the first break. Before we get to that and just the general stuff we'll cover. There is a ton of episodes coming up, not only on the feeds for the podcast, but also the YouTube channel. Um, You will be getting essentially an episode pretty much every single day now until the 24th of December, where we close our doors for two weeks for some well-earned respite. So just keep that in mind. The order of reviews coming your way between now and the 1st of December is today dropping a review of Torture Garden. Tomorrow you'll be getting a review of House by the Cemetery which includes our Gates of Hell trilogy and then on Thursday you'll be getting our final episode covering the Amicus series so you'll be getting our final review there. Then as of Monday the 1st of December basically for 24 days back-to-back episodes. Monday is going to be a really interesting one, so the Mondays all the way right through our Listener Choice episodes, of which you will get three of those, but on the 1st of December, you'll be getting an epic five-hour episode covering the first half of Brian De Palma's career in a director's conversation with myself, Bo Ransdell and Doug Tilly, so that's looking at everything from 1967 all the way through to Dress to Kill in 1980, so that is dropping on the 1st of December. Let's get into this, shall we? We're going to take a short break, you're going to see the trailer for Torture Garden, when we return we're discussing that movie and we're doing it right after this. There lies another world, the sinister world of Dr. Diablo. The real torture garden. It is not for the faint of heart. What you find there will be more terrifying, more horrendous than your deepest, darkest dreams. Who has the courage to try it? You, Jack Palance. Have you the courage to face its heaven store for you? You, Burgess Meredith, as the devil incarnate. What horror will you next reveal? You, Beverly Adams, what lies beyond your dreams to be devil your future? The Torture Garden. Many people walk the length of its terror. No. I'll do it! I'll do it! This is the writer who shields the secrets of immortality. Did you know that there are ways to raise the dead? The rich man who'd sooner part with his life than his wealth. The money! (laughs) 
the torture garden. It's where the devil calls the tune to play a concerto of fear. There's a man out there with, with his head all... You are trapped. And welcome back. So, let's talk about Torture Garden, shall we? I'm going to be checking out the IMDb, and whilst I do that, you are going to get some stills from the movie. Torture Garden is directed by Freddie Francis, based on the short stories of Robert Block. It was released in 1967, has a runtime of about an hour and a half. It stars Jack Palance. It also has Burgess Meredith, Beverly Adams, Peter Cushion, Michael Bryant, John Standing, Robert Hutton, John Phillips, Michael Ripper, Bernard Kay, Catherine Finn, Morris Denham, with David Bauer, Niall McGuinness, Nicole Shelby, Roy Stevens, and Norman Claridge. The synopsis for this one is listed on IMDb as an anthology of four short horror stories about people who visit Dr. Diablo's Fairground Haunted House Attraction show. So like previous entries in the the, the old Amicus anthology, you kind of know what you're getting. At this stage, with it only being the second movie, the cliches haven't fully set in yet. But if you're smart enough, savvy enough, or you've seen any anthology before, read any EC comics, you can kind of know where we're going from the off. I mean, Dr. Diablo, I mean... It's a bit on the nose. It's so on the nose that you might just want to punch yourself right in the centre of your face. The linking story for this one is that we have four people and then a tag along of Jack Palance who pay the what seems like pricely sum of five pounds sterling to Dr. Diablo to get the primo cut of his haunted house, which is very much off to the side and only for those that can afford to do so. It reveals a waxwork statue, which seems to be alive, of a Greek goddess who holds a pair of scissors over four threads, coloured threads, with each person going up, they look at the scissors, gaze into the reflection that comes back, and they see a glimpse of a potential future for them. As you can imagine, with this being a horror movie and an amicus production, none of those futures look too bright, um, so you don't have to wear shades. The first story is Enoch, and in this one here, we kick off with fine fashion, amicus styled short of uh, essentially our our protagonist slash antagonist uh, caring after his elderly uncle, who for some reason inexplicably is flush with gold coins but no one knows why and he's decided that he is as his uncle is pretty much on his deathbed he's going to try and get to the heart of where this gold coin storage is this fortune that he sits on the uncle doesn't want to tell him but his failing heart requires him to have medication administered regularly and he essentially holds this over his uncle until his uncle tells him that's in the basement he goes downstairs and uh, digs uh, comes across a container with a cat inside. This cat seems to commune with him and demand blood, which then sets him on a, a kind of crime spree of murder to bring the bodies back to the cat so the cat will give him gold coins. This goes on for a little bit and then we find out that it's actually been a dream, but in kind of final destination fashion the set pieces of that conversation that led to the reveal of the cat play out exactly the same as before and when he goes down to the basement again he finds the cat who then all but commands him again to bring him dead bodies bring him heads to chew upon uh, this cat being some vehicle for, for some sort of demon and he slowly starts to lose it as he murders more and more, ultimately up until his arrest. When he's arrested though, he tries to warn the police that if the cat doesn't get his blood, it's going to get into his head and kill him. And of course the police don't believe any of this until the cat actually shows up, gets into his head and drives him insane and kills him. To which we jump back out 
and uh, return to Dr. Diablo's haunted house. As kickoffs go, this is really cool. I like this one. It's preposterous in a way that I can kind of get behind. Uh, the idea of being controlled by an animal or seemingly feeling like you are being controlled by an animal to kill is kind of a cool uh, concept. It's been done before, it'll be done again. But it kind of works in the context of the story. The 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 kind of setup, the only issue I have with the setup is that we run quite a bit in before it's revealed that this is at first a dream then that plays out again. I feel personally that's a bit of an anchor on the story. So I feel like you went through certain beat points ultimately for it to reset to then go back through exactly the same beat points. It doesn't fully work out for me overall but narratively speaking as a story it's fun, it's quirky, kind of puts you in the mood of the ookie spookies and it delivers blood, it delivers murder, uh, delivers demonic cats, all those sort of things you kind of want from an Amicus production. So as an opening, it's not like super strong by any stretch in the imagination, but it's not terrible either. Um, I kind of dug it for what it, for what it's worth. It's also worth saying that I thought I'd seen Torture Garden before, but I had never seen it. So very quickly, by the halfway point of this first segment here, I was fully aware that this was a first time watch for me. So as those things kind of set out, I thought the, the kind of opening first story landed pretty strong. Story number two is Terror Over Hollywood. And this one here, we have an aspiring actress who is already realising that there's a bit of a glass ceiling for her career. Um, she is, and as a really interesting commentary, she is in an industry where men are allowed to grow old and continue to be stars of the silver screen where she herself has a relatively short shelf life as an actress and she's trying to compete against better established names. She, through a series of kind of happenstance, comes across a weird conspiracy in Hollywood where people attend the same surgeon slash doctor and he seems to help them prolong their career. As she further investigates down, she starts to realise that there's a, a subplot of murder and of extras who look like actors being bumped off in interesting fashion ultimately to land on the reveal that the actors that we know and love, the stars of Hollywood, are actually synthetic, completely synthetic. There is a medical procedure that this doctor, Dr. Hind, has come across being able to transplant the brain into a synthetic body which will never age. Kind of very get out, so to speak. Um, and this conspiracy has meant that the, the top names in Hollywood will exist uh, ad infinitum forever at the top of their game. Um, also, a little bit of Death Becomes are in there as well. Can't imagine that the, the, the writers of Death Becomes her hadn't come across this story. Um, she decides that she's going to expose this only to be captured by the, the Doctor and uh, the, the actors who are the leading men of Hollywood and she herself, at the end of the movie, is turned into a synthetic body with the brain uh, to the overheard calls of she looks doll-like. Um, this one, in principle, I like the idea of it. Uh, I think the acting's cool. I think the cinematography and the score for this one are really, really fun. The story is... Like, once you get a handle that something weird's going on, I don't necessarily think this is wholly remarkable. I actually found it to be a bit plodding uh, once I kind of got a full grasp of where I thought the story was going and then ultimately the reveal gave me exactly what I anticipated. Once again, you're, you're looking at this through 2023 eyes. Back in 1967, this probably was a more original story, but this one here felt like it kind of actually slowed a lot of the momentum that came out of the first short and as a result it kind of sits somewhere in the realms of kind of black comedy a little bit twee uh, and trying also to be kind of meta and knowing about the industry as well um, which I think overall didn't work for me I've seen this done a lot better longer form so even you know 
where it shouldn't necessarily work on a longer version. Like Starry Eyes, for, for an example, is a great version of this story done just a hundred times better. So yeah, I wasn't sold on this one, if I'm honest. It kind of didn't really do much for me. Didn't hate it. Got want to stress that. Didn't hate it. But overall, it was a bit meh, if I'm being honest. But if Story 2 was a bit meh, Story 3 really takes the biscuit. This one, I'd heard of by reputation, but I'd obviously never seen it. Um, and if you like this one, fair play to you, but I found this one boggling. Uh, so this is Mr. Steinway. This is the other female uh, character who has paid money to get into Dr. Diablo's haunted house. And she gaze, gazes upon the scissors and dreams of a future version of herself who is very much infatuated and loved with this troubled, widowed pianist who seems to be still very much haunted and wounded by his ex. And as she tries to make him love her more, he starts to tell her that her spirit still exists in the, in the apartment. And it possesses the piano, the Steinway, um, to which she doesn't heed the warnings of and continues to pursue the relationship even though windows start smashing, keys on the piano are like ominously rammed um, and you get these musical stabs and whatnot. The, the, this one doesn't really... This one's pretty bad. The The end result of this one is that she is killed by a possessed piano. So let that sink in. The piano starts moving across the room and forces her out a window into her death. And someone somewhere thought this was a great idea. Uh, maybe Robert Block thought this was a great idea. And maybe this works better on page. Um, it's very goofy. Very, very, very goofy. It's also really slow. Like once, Like once we've established that there's something weird happening in this apartment. I don't know why it then takes like a further 15 minutes for her to die. Um, it builds up, but it builds up with the same tension all the way through. There's no palpable increase. It's just very, very, very goofy. Tonally, it doesn't quite sit here because it's played, unlike the previous short, this one's played completely straight all the way right through, even though the subject matter is completely absurd. Um... I don't really have much more to say. It's probably the most simplistic of all the shorts here. And it's the one that falls apart most for me on the watching. I couldn't believe my eyes when it finished. Um, and kind of have vowed to myself that if I can get through life never seeing it again, that would be kind of good. Yeah, I really disliked this one. I thought it was not in keeping with the calibre of the remaining ones. Or the preceding ones, which are not of the calibre of the best I've seen from Amicus, but this one's really kind of scraping the barrel, and we're only our second anthology in. So we swung into our final story. Uh, Jack Palance has been a character in the background, as Burgess Meredith has been kicking around as Dr. Diablo. We're going to get to him, specifically Dr. Diablo um, and Burgess Meredith's performance, which is very Penguin-esque, um, at the end when we talk about the Lincoln story. But Palance seems to be... A guy that knows a little bit of what's going on with Dr. Diablo. Maybe this is a bit of a scheme. And he steps forward when the remaining man of the original group of four, terrified, refuses to to take part. And Palance comes in, he stares at the scissors and he sees this vision of the future. Palance is a book collector, specifically a collector of the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, this one is called The Man the Man Who Collected Poe. He is in England. He is a, a kind of soiree and he's introduced to Peter Cushion, who is <laughs> very fun in this one. Cushion, obviously, in Dr. Terror's House of Horror, had played the Diablo-esque character in that one. Um, in this one, Cushing is a collector of Poe. Not only is he a collector of Poe, but his father was a collector of Poe. And as such, he's amassed the greatest collection of first edition and um, surrounding documents, uh, bric-a-brac, artefacts, anything Poe related, he has it. And Palance strikes up a, a kind of friendly relationship with him, but ultimately wants to see the collection. So the... the arranged to have a meet, Palance arrives um, and they begin to get very drunk or 
Talan starts to get Cushing very drunk because he feels that what's out in display in the main area here isn't the good stuff. The good stuff would be locked away. So as this continues on, Cushing gets further and further drunk and drunk Cushing is a great performance. It's so over the top and it's got the <laughs> kind of hiccup noises and all the rest. Um, Cushing takes him downstairs into a kind of locked area of his house and in here there is tons of very rare artefacts including a lot of manuscripts that are of stories that look like they've been written by Poe that have never been published. And Palance is fascinated by this because it's never come up in his research but when he researches the, the paper more these stories have been written in 1966 so long after Poe's death and he assumes at first forgery until Cushing tells him that his dad was a practitioner in the occult and managed to resurrect Poe. Um, and, of course, Polance is like, well, what's behind that locked door? And Cushing won't let him go behind there. So he kills him with a candlestick holder. It's very clue. Um, and then goes through and finds Edgar Allan Poe, uh, reanimated and cursed to continue to live existence on this planet in some sort of weird between-worlds hellscape. Um... Poe offers to kind of offers a solution to help him be set free, but Palance is very naive and doesn't dig into the detail. And basically, what he says is, "I can be released through fire." So Palance Giddy uh, decides to essentially burn to set him free. But Poe then gives him a warning about setting him free requires that the devil take something in his place, i.e., Palance. And as the building is burning down, he's kind of maniacally laughing. And then we jump back to Palance himself. So let's talk about the Lincoln story. It's like obviously evident, Dr. Diablo, so Dr. Devil, is that, you know, that's basically where we're going with this one, right from the off. And Burgess Meredith is perfectly cast here, loads of costume changes. Like I said before, he's basically the Penguin from his TV appearances in the original Batman. Um... But I kind of love it. It's it's so over the top and it's so campy. There's a costume change almost every in between every Lincoln story. It, it, it's kind of fun. It's quirky as to his character. Um, after all these characters have been suitably scarred from what they've seen, we get this great scene of um, the guy who didn't want to look at the scissors, uh, grabbing the scissors and killing Doctor Diablo, stabbing him through the heart um, through fear. And everyone, of course, runs away, apart from this guy. And it's revealed that actually they're partners, and this has all been a set-up all along. And Palance has hung back because he knows who Dr. Diablo really is, and this hasn't been a set-up at all. Burgess Meredith turns round and reveals some of the worst prosthetics I've ever seen, that he is actually the devil, and it ends. And this is pretty shitty, and the reason it's pretty shitty is it doesn't actually make any sense. If this guy who is partners with Diablo, has to set up a fake death. I don't know why the devil would need that. I um, also don't know how Polance would know. And as a result, it kind of all falls apart uh, pretty bad right at the very end, even though the performances are kind of cool. Um, at his best, the final segment, The Man Who Collected Poe, is the standout for me. It's the runaway of all the shorts. I love how it's put together. I love Jack Palance in it. I obviously know Jack Palance from much later performances that you forget he actually had a lot more range in his earlier roles. Um, I like Burgess Meredith in the Lincoln story even though I think the Lincoln story is pretty poor. Plus it's just the same as the previous short that uh, Amicus did and to be honest it's the same in every Amicus short. It kind of feels like of like the Stephen King will just make it aliens. Yeah, you know, aliens at the end of his books when he can't write an end to his novels. That's kind of what I get here. It just kind of feels like just make it the devil again. Which makes you wonder if they were going to do that, why they didn't just bring back Peter Cushion in the same role but give him a different place. I don't I don't get the thought process. Like Doctor Terror becomes Doctor Diablo. Why not? You know, he's, he's set up shop in a new place. He's doing the same thing again. Wholly confusing. Um, the two middle stories really dragged this down for me. The absurdity of Mr. Steinway, the piano, is just absolutely awful. And the Hollywood story had the potential but didn't really go where I wanted to. So, 
compared to Doctor Terror's House of Horror, I I think this one is a step down. And it kind of feels like it's running out of steam already on the second anthology. We know that things get better because we've covered the final one that Amicus released and they were firing on all cylinders on that. So yeah, I, I would be lying if I said that I was a big fan of Torture Garden on a first watch. I'd give this a 2.5 out of 5. That being somewhere between didn't like it and liked it. There's enough elements to give it that 0.5. Had they not been there, this would have been a solid 2 for sure. And that's my thoughts on Torture Garden from 1967. Like I said, there's plenty of content coming up. Tomorrow you will be getting a review of House by the Cemetery, closing out our um, Gates of Hell trilogy by Lucio Fulci. Wednesday, a little breather and a day off. And then Thursday, the 30th of November, you're getting our final Amicus review. So keep your eyes peeled for that. As always, if you're checking us out on YouTube, hit subscribe, give us a little like and leave a comment. How do you get on with Torture Garden? Do you like it more than me? Which is entirely plausible because it seems I am maybe a bit too uh, critical of this one overall compared to what the rest of the internet has. Um, if you don't like it, let me know. What's your favourite short? Post it in the comments. If you're checking us out on Spotify or Anchor, answer the question that posts at the end of the episode. And if you're checking us out in audio format in any of the podcatchers out there, make sure you're subscribed. That way you get the shows as and when they drop and access to the entire back catalogue of about 1,300 episodes at the date of this recording. Thank you very much for checking out this episode. I hope you have a great day. And wherever you are, what the time zone is, and what you're up to in this big bad world of ours, this is Duncan Cleese broadcasting live from under the stairs, and I am signing off. <laughs>